Hello everyone. First of all, let's start with a quick question. What kind of lifestyle would you prefer? The one on the left, as you might know, that's DJ Khalid, one of the most extravagant, extravagant rappers from the US. Um, he is uh, living a life with lots of diamonds, luxury cars, real estate, fancy vacations, fancy parties, or on the other side, on the right side. Um, the pure, eco-friendly, environmentally loving way of the people you see in these pictures. I mean, obviously, this is an exaggeration, but it leads us to the topic we want to talk about today, which is going green to be seen, status, reputation, and conspicuous conservation. It's, that's a paper from Chris Kevichius, Tibor, and Van der Berg from 2010. So, another question, since this is a very interactive presentation. Um, why do you think consumers buy the more costly Toyota Prius hybrid, an electric vehicle, which is, as a matter of fact, um, the most frequently buy car in the US? Or, on the other side, the fuel-efficient Honda Civic? So, what do you think? A, it costs less fuel. B, the, it has lower emissions. C, it makes a statement. Or D, it saves you time. Yeah, Sarah? I think it's A, it costs less fuel. Ah, I'm sorry, Sarah, but that's unfortunately wrong. So, um, according to the New York Times, the number one reason why people buy the Prius is not because they are so environmentally friendly or conscious, but the most often stated response what it makes a statement about me, which is pretty interesting um, since this car is not really a statement or what you expect, what a statement would look like in the first place. But things have changed in recent years. So, why is this paper relevant? What has actually changed? Um, I think we don't have to mention the climate change, change in biodiversity, the nitrate cycle, bushfires. I mean, look at the news. Look how, mon how much plastic is in the ocean. Just open your eyes, watch any kind of media, and you see that it's almost too late. So, let's get people be intrinsically motivated to change the world, to make a better and sustainable place of it. How can this be done? So this guy, Publius Serus, um, was a Roman living in 100 before Christ, so that's pretty long ago, and he already said a good reputation is more valuable than money. Which leads us um, to the next slide. So how can we actually change consumer behavior while making a shift toward pro-social behavior such as environmental conservation. Um, <laughs> so there are three different perspectives. The first one is the environmental concern perspective. People are presumed to engage in conservation primarily because they at some level are intrinsically motivated and intrinsically care about the well-being of the planet. The second pers perspective is the rational economic perspective. Conservation is primarily driven by economic reasons. And the third one is the social and reputational perspective. That means that people are socially oriented and their motives can be seen in that regards. So they be even more powerful at influencing people's tendency to conserve and to be cooperative. Then there's another aspect. So the reputation aspect of the conservation, meaning what a person can communicate about themselves by going green as pro-social behavior can have important functional consequences. So engaging pro-social behavior such as environmental conservation, for example, can build a pro-social reputation. Such individuals, that you, that's what you can see on the, um, on the slide, they are seen as more trustworthy, they are more desirable as friends, as allies, and as romantic partners. Also, the notion um, that pro-social individuals are desirable to have in positions of power suggests that pro-social behavior may be, viable, may be a viable strategy for attaining status. So, um, apparently, there's something like an inherent theme across individuals in diverse cultures and historical um, periods. So to compete for status, for status by trying to be seen as relatively more altruistic is a concept known as competitive altruism. 
So what you can see here um, is a potlatch. That's an opul opulent ceremonial feast um, to celebrate important events held by tribes of Northwest Indians in North America. A potlatch is character characterized by a ceremony in which possessions are given away or destroyed to actually display wealth, generosity and enhance prestige. Thus, the person who is able to give away the most resources is regarded as the highest standard. Not very often a young man, like this young man, <coughs> he likes to share his wealth with his people. That's our culture. The wealth of a chief always shares share his wealth with his people. And this is what he's done tonight. So, to sum up, competitive altruism is when the altruistic act is performed primarily for the purpose of advertising one's own altruistic tendencies. But how was it able to prevail when it decreased needed resources of the giver? So these questions and the last slides have already described a theory which we want to explain a little further. It is called the, signaling, the costly signaling theory and which is one example how to explain this just mentioned altruism. By definition, altruism benefits others at the cost of depleting the giver's resources needed for survival, reproduction or kin care. Self-sacrifice is costly, therefore it is puzzling from many perspectives like rational economic perspective and the evolutionary gene selection, selection perspective. One explanation for the prevalence of altruism stems from costly signaling theory. So, what is it? It means altruistic acts are a communicative signal. It means that a person is signaling to be pro-social and this person and that this person gives time, energy, money or other resources away without expecting to get something in return. What does this mean in terms of environmental conservation? People engage in these behaviors to attain status. So green products signaling that they are willing and able to buy products that might benefit others. Thus, activating a motive for status may lead people to engage in conspicuous conservation, which in turn lead to public pro-environmental acts. So, um, according to this theory, the altruistic act is a communicative signal. And what you can see here is one example, not from the human world, but from the animal kingdom. So, this is the Arabian Babla. You've probably never heard of me, neither. So, they compete, compete with other group members to be the group sentinel, the one responsible for watching out for predators. So, they are putting themselves more in danger, and the more time they spend being the sentinel, the higher they rise in status. So, they want to compete with others to be alone, to be the only single babbler who's looking out for um, predators. Anyways, back to to the humans, their behavior, and how it can be explained. Let's get to the actual study. So, um, there were three experiments, and the goal was to find out how activating for status motives can influence people's choice. They had to choose between luxurious products, what I displayed here is the, I don't know if it's a BMW, I think so, fancy sports car, and a more green product, in this case, a car. So, um, the first experiment. Um, in experiment one, the prediction was that activating status motives should increase the likelihood of choosing the less luxuri luxurious and more pro-social cream products. They derived the following hypothesis. First, non-green products should be chosen more frequently in the control motive condition. Second, Activating status motives should increase the likelihood of choosing the less, less luxurious and more pro-social green products. So, what have they done? Um, there were 168 participants, 65 men, 103 women, at a large public university, so probably psychology, psychology students. Anyway, they were using an experimental design with two between-subjects motive conditions. 
status and control. The participants could choose between relatively luxurious non-green products and less luxurious pro-environmental green products. They were equally priced. To elicit status motives, participants read a short story about 700 words that has been used success successfully to elicit status motives in previous research. Um, whereas control motives were elicited by reading a short story of similar length about losing a concert ticking, finding it, and heading to the concert with same sex peers to avoid any other motives. So they had to choose between a car, a green one, and a non green one, a household cleaner, which was more or less toxic, and finally a dishwasher. So the results. Um, they're actually supporting hypothesis one. In the control condition, participants were more likely to choose the non-green car. As you can see, 26.8% choose the non-green option, whereas 37.2% choose the green car. In the control group, where 74% choose the non-green household cleaner and 65% choose the non-green dishwasher. Thus, in absence of status motives, all the green products were more desirable than their green counterparts. There were also support for hypothesis too. When status motives were activated and increased people's tendency to forego luxury when given the opportunity to choose an equally priced green product. So let's go to the second experiment. Um, after all, the traditional perspectives predict that the status motives actually should lead people to especially want luxurious and higher quality products and not the green ones. So why did eliciting for status motives produce the opposite outcome in the first study? According to costly signaling theory, one of the key factors of how status motives should influence purchasing decisions is the extent, extent to which the purchase is public versus private. So that's apparently important. Thus, the second study aimed to investigate if shopping in private or public leads to different outcomes. Therefore, they derived the, the hypothesis First one was um, predicted that when people consider shopping in public, similar conditions as in study one, um, status motives should increase preferences for green products over more luxurious and better performing non-green products. Second was um, that when people consider shopping in private, status motives should not produce the same outcome. So. Um, the, the participants were 93 students, 58 men, 35 women at a large public university. They were reading the same um, study again, but um, should purchase the other um, products, which is um, a battery, a lamp, or a backpack. So in the first study, participants had a green and a non-green option for each product. So the, and it's the same conditions, both equal in price and were made by the same company. The non-green product was superior on luxury and the green product was inferior in pro-environmental features. Um, so let's have a look at the results. The results are supporting the hypothesis. Status motives led people to prefer green products relatively to more luxurious non-green products when people were actually shopping in public. When people were shopping in private, status motives increased the desire for luxurious, self-indulgent, non-green product and thus supporting hypothesis 2. In line with costly signaling theory, status motives led people to forego luxury and desire pro-social environmental products only when it was salient that such choices could be observed and influence one reputation. So, there's also a third study. Um, this takes a closer look towards the influence of pricing. The previous findings are not in line with previous research, research which has shown that conservation behaviors such as recycling and taking public transportation are associated with lower status and not higher status because such pro-environmental actions signal that persons does not have enough resources to behave otherwise. Therefore, costly signaling theory suggests that lowering the price of cream products creates an important reputational dilemma. That means buying a cheaper green product rather than a more expensive non-green product uh, might explicitly, explicitly signal that a person cannot afford the more expensive product. Therefore, a current study where examined how status motives influence the attractiveness of green versus non-green products when the price of green products 
was either higher or lower than its non-green powder counterpart. Therefore, they again had two hypotheses. The first one was that predicted in a control condition, as predicted in control condition, green products would be preferred when they are less expensive than their non-green counterparts, which is in accordance with the rational economic perspective. The second was that when activating status motives um, should reverse these preferences. Status motives should lead green products to become more desirable when green products are relatively more expensive because such products can signal both pro-sociality and wealth, which is in accordance with the costly signaling theory. So again, um, 156 participants, um, 50 men, 106 women, all students at public university. Same conditions, um, again, a two times two um, design with the motives of status and control and the green products and non-green products. And in this case, the prices of the uh, counterpart products differed from each other by about 20%. So you can see the four quartiles. And then they have to, they have to decide between the, a car, a dishwasher, and a backpack. So um, here are the results. They are supporting hypothesis one. In a controlled co condition, allowing the price of cream products made them more desirable and in line with rational economic perspectives. And even the second hypothesis was supported. That means status motives led pro-social cream products to be desirable specifically when, they, when the cream products cost more than their non-green counterparts. When green, green products were relatively cheaper, status motives actually decrease the desire for these inexpensive pro-environmental products. This is consistent with costly signaling perspective on altruism, um, a desire for status elicited pro-social tendencies, especially when people, when the pro-social acts were costly. So, um, to sum it up in the discussion, in the first study, um, we saw when status is activated, green products um, are preferred over luxurious non-green ones. In the second study, um, they took a look at how does public, how does being um, being seen have an influence. So it means when um, status is activated in public, less luxurious green products are preferred over luxurious non-greens one. Whereas in private, it goes the other way around. So less luxurious green products um, are inferior to luxurious non-green ones. In the third study, um, we took a look at the pricing and it means when status is activated there, it increased the desire for green products if they cost more. But there were no difference um, between the different type of products, either it was cars, backpacks or batteries or whatever, or dishwashers. No difference. So, as a conclusion, activating status motives can lead people to buy more green. So what are the practical impl implications of it? Yeah, just link products to ce celebrities or events, make them relatively expensive and we as a society, we have to make sure that this pro-social, pro environmentally friendly behavior is cool, hip and will get positively conditioned. That's how we can learn and change behavior. So, again, to the smart Roman guy, Publius Cyrus. A good reputation is more valuable than money. Welcome. Nice car. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not mine. I love your car. Yeah, it's mine. <laughs> I bet it's fast. Me too, yeah. <laughs> and comfortable. Do you, uh, you like leather seats? <laughs> yeah. And peacock's feathers difficult them from running and flying away from predator.
Among the many factors that influence people's spending on luxury products, one of them is the desire to fulfill social motivations for status and prestige. This phenomenon, called conspicuous consumption, can be defined as attaining and exhibiting costly items to impress upon others that one possesses wealth or status. Peacocks are referred to as heavenly birds. This behavior might seem unnecessary and ineffective, but some evidence points out that conspicuous behavior is linked to mating strategy. So, from an evolutionary perspective, it was suggested that conspicuous consumption served to gain reproductive rewards and communicative signals advertising the sender's quality as a mate. In this study, therefore, both the display and the perception size of conspicuous consumption are examined. Curious about it? Different explanations for conspicuous consumption have been suggested, indeed. All, sexual selection, a part of natural selection by Darwin that seeks to explain traits that contribute to survival in some way. According to this theory, conspicuous features might be useful because they enhance an individual's attractiveness to the opposite sex. Secondly, parental investment might explain why conspicuous consumption occurs. Parental investment refers to the contribution made by each parent to the production of a viable offspring. Since males can produce offspring by putting in less effort than females, men tend to be more competitive, which implies that males possess more conspicuous traits in species where males provide low levels of investment. Griskovicius and his colleagues found that situational activations of mating motives led men, but not women, to want to conspicuously spend and perform public acts of heroism. This could explain why men want to display conspicuous behavior. What do women think about these treats? Generally, humans lie in between a non-investing and ultra-investing strategy. Women may use conspicuous handicapping displays to evaluate men for short-term partnerships, such as potentially risky intersexually aggressive behaviors. These traits are particularly interesting in short-term partners and can signal a man's ability to withstand the costs of direct competition with other men. So, spending money conspicuously will lead me to have a partner? In a certain way, yes. But, men demonstrate that they have little offsetting survival benefits by spending money wastefully and conspicuously. Given a putative correspondence between heritable genetic quality and any of the traits demonstrated by conspicuous consumption, women may preferentially select men who consume conspicuously as short-term partners. Women may seek flattering relationships to obtain a short-term provision of economic benefits. So, conspicuous consumption is linked only with short-term relationship? Please, get me through this. Um, no, it's a little bit more complex. Life history theory states that individuals must allocate their finite resources budget to somatic effort, mating effort, and parenting effort. Investment in one category implies less to invest in other categories. There are individual differences within any species, including within sex differences. 
that makes sense. Please tell me more. People also vary in choosing a long-term high investing strategy or a short-term non-investing strategy. Different possible patterns arise here. First of all, men's conspicuous consumption could be linked with short-term mating goals rather than long-term mating goals. This implies putting oneself before others. This type of selfish conspicuous consumption does not indicate a reliable responsible investing partner and may thus not serve long-term mating goals. A second alternative is that conspicuous consumption could serve to further a long-term rather than a short-term mating strategy, explained by the fact that women desire evidence of economic resources for a long-term partner. This type of conspicuous consumption is thus expected to enhance a man's desirability as a long-term mating partner and is not shown in low investment strategies. A third alternative is that conspicuous consumption could make a man more desirable as either a short-term or a long-term mate. In this case, no within-sex differences in spending behavior and no influence of mating context would be expected. More. And the definition was coined by... Okay, this is deep, but why does this matter in this new information? These findings provide important insight into conspicuous consumption. Therefore, they contribute to emerging literature about human life history strategies. Regarding consumer behavior, the findings give a major comprehension of the psychological mechanism of a consumer in terms of Okay, sure, I will briefly explain it for you. In this study, the nature of conspicuous consumption as a mating oriented signaling system is examined. In total, four studies were conducted. The first three studies differentiate between men and mating contexts of men in displaying conspicuous products as a mating strategy, which include sexually unrestricted men, all men irrespective of their sexual strategy, and sexually restricted men. In the fourth study, the extent to which products display signals of information about the owner's mating strategy and how and whether the conspicuous consumption influences the desirability as a mate will be assessed. So, in the first study, the following research question was examined. How does the activation of mating motives influence unrestricted versus restricted men's and women's conspicuous consumption desires? Mating motives were elicited using an established priming method, whereby people viewed photographs of attractive and available members of the opposite sex. After priming of a mating or a control motive, participants allocated a $2,000 budget across several categories of consumer products, ranging from low to high conspicuousness. Participants were students with a mean age of 21.9 years old. The study followed a 2x2 design with participant sex and mating motives. So there were two conditions, a mating condition and a control condition. After the spending the budget, a conspicuousness index for each participant was calculated. So what was found in the study? Thanks for asking. The results actually showed the following. Mating condition and conspicuous consumption for males following a low investment strategy showed a positive slope and turned out to be significantly different from zero. For males following a relatively high investment strategy, the slope was not significantly different from zero, which suggests that the mating prime had essentially no effect. 
For women, the simple slope for women adopting a low investment strategy was not significant. However, the slope for women, adop for women adopting a high investment strategy was significant, which was quite surprising. So in study two, a different mating motive manipulation was used to address potential alternative explanations for study one's results. This time, mating motives were elicited by participants reading a short romantic story. And after this, participants had to indicate their desire to buy a product that would be perceived by others as either high or low status. In this study, it was also tested whether the de desire for buying conspicuous consumption is to feel better about oneself or to signal others. To test this, a designer replica was used, of which the owner would know was lower in status but that would still appear to others as high in status. Participants had a mean age of 23.8 years old and there were still a mating condition and a control condition. Also, two control conditions were added. To exclude alternative explanations of the control condition in study 1. And what can we conclude from this? Now. So the relation between mating condition and conspicuous wallet purchase for men following a low investment mating strategy turned out to be significant. For the male participants with a high investment strategy, the results were not significant. These results indicate that the mating prime did not influence spending on the low status wallet for men, regardless of their intended mating investment. I understand better. Please tell me about the rest. Now, let's move on to study three. In this study, long-term versus short-term mating motives were assessed. Factors that trigger conspicuous consumption were tested. Study three explicitly manipulated key features of mating context to examine which types of cues do and do not trigger the desire to woo with waste. Two mating con contexts were used. A short-term mating motive associated with low investment and uncommitted romantic flings and a long-term mating motive associated with a high investment committed relationship. So the study followed a between participant design uh, with men versus women and short term versus long term. After the motive manipulation, participants indicated how much money they would spend on conspicuous products that in pilot testing were appealing to men and women. This created the dependent measure. Research and the studies that support these valuable So the results showed that the relation between the short-term mating prime and conspicuous spending for males following a low investment mating strategy was positive and significantly different from zero. This indicates that expected spending on showy products is driven specifically by a motive for short-term mating. The same relation for males following a relatively high investment strategy turned out to be not significant. In regards to the long-term mating prime for males following a low investment strategy, this slope was not significantly different from zero. This suggests that the long-term mating prime did not increase the conspicuous purchase intentions of high and low investment males. Formation. Fablen. Final study, study four. This st study examines observers' responses to conspicuous consumers. Men and women were asked to indicate the extent of the desirability of an opposite sex person who had recently purchased either a conspicuous or a non-conspicuous car. 
Participants were students with a mean age of 21.4 years old. The experiment used a 2 by 2 design. What's the point? What do pickups and luxury cars have in common? Well, pickup calls are extremely loud. To our e lecture about conspicuous consumption. Now that we know all of this, what can we conclude? So, in sum, this research demonstrates that the motivation to conspicuously consume and display may be most prominent among men pursuing a sexual strategy that involves low parental investment. Conspicuous consumption was pronounced among men interested in short-term mating liaisons and was perceived accordingly by women. This study makes a novel contribution to research in that it leverages life history theory and principles to enhance understanding of how people make trade-offs in economic resources to consumption choices. This multi-level insight creates powerful insight in human behavior and is therefore a great contribution to the field of consumer behavior. How you doing? Who has the most amazing Porsche under there? I'd love to show you, but I just tucked her in. She's sleeping. <laughs> hey, uh, would you two girls like to go for a drink? Hello everyone and welcome to our e-lecture. Today's e-lecture is on conspicuous consumption. It focuses on women's luxury products as signals to other women. Shopping is loved by almost every woman in the world. On a day off, women tend to spend their time going from shop to shop with their girlfriends. I am sure we are all familiar with designer brands such as Gucci, Louis Vuitton, Prada, and Christian Dior. But did you know that women purchase on average three handbags each year? That means that every year around $525 billion is spent on luxury goods in the United States alone. Apart from the quality time that women spend while going shopping, buying luxurious goods also has other functions. As so much money is gone to these luxuries, it is important to understand what its function is. Some previous research has shown that products can boost self-esteem and signal status. More specifically, 
For men, luxurious goods are used as a sexual signaling system in which romantic partners are attracted. That brings us to the aim of the study, which is to investigate the idea that women use designer products as a signaling system directed to other women who pose a threat to a woman's relationship. The study expects that women use luxury to show other women that their partner is devoted to them. Also, these luxury handbags and shoes help deter rivals from poaching their partner. An important concept in this research is mate guarding. Mate guarding refers to managing the threats of romantic competitors. This usually happens when individuals sense a threat to their romantic relationship. Luxury products are used as a way of mate guarding and functions as an intrasexual signaling system. Having understood that, it brings us to this research, which is divided into five different studies. The first study examined whether women infer information about a woman's relationship based on the luxuriousness of her possessions. The first study hypothesizes that a woman with luxurious possessions should be perceived by other women as having a more devoted partner. This is compared to a woman with less luxurious possessions. So how did they test this? The study consisted of 69 female participants which were randomly assigned to two conditions, being designer products and non-designer products. They were given two descriptions of a woman at a party with her date. They were identical, except that one woman was described as wearing a designer outfit and the other woman was described as wearing a non-designer outfit. They were asked on a 7-point scale how much they think the man loves the woman and how much they think the man is committed to the woman. So the results showed that it was consistent with the hypothesis, meaning other women infer that a man is more devoted to his partner when she has luxurious products. This brings us to the second study of this research with the following hypothesis. Activating a mate guarding motive to trigger a woman's desire for conspicuous luxury goods. So the sample of the second study consisted of 137 female students. And they were randomly assigned to four different conditions, being mate guarding, meets attraction, neutral control, and negative effect control. The participants were asked to come to a lab and were seated in individual rooms with a table and a computer. They were asked to perform several tasks, one of which is reading short stories or scenarios on mate guarding and mate attraction. Manipulation pretests were also taken by a separate sample in order to ensure that the manipulations provoked the expected levels of negative effect and arousal. The dependent measure assessed the desire for conspicuousness. This was done by showing four different products to the participants. These products were designer handbag, dress shoes, t-shirts and sports car as shown in a picture. For each product, three possible brands were provided. These were Chanel, Louis Vuitton, and Gucci. The participants were then given a pencil and a letter-sized picture of the product. They were then asked to draw the logo. So the results of the second study were also as predicted. You can see this by looking at the black bars in the graph, which indicate the women in the mate guarding condition. These women drew significantly larger logos than women in the mate attraction condition. This indicates that mate guarding motive increased women's desire for conspicuous consumption, as measured by wanting larger luxury brand logos. Moving on to the third study of this research. This study hypothesizes that a motive to guard a mate should lead women to seek publicly conspicuous luxury goods but not less conspicuous products that are generally used in private. These are things such as a washing machine, alarm or knives. The third study consisted of 115 female participants. 
The study had a mixed design that contained three conditions and two product types. The conditions included maid guarding, female control, and self-esteem control. And the two product types were conspicuous and non-conspicuous. So participants were randomly assigned to one of the three conditions in which they were asked to imagine a situation and write their feelings. Here, a manipulation pretest was also taken. The participants were asked about their desire for luxury compared to their peers. These products consisted of goods that were easy to observe publicly and also products that were often less publicly visible. So the results indicated that the hypothesis was confirmed. Maid guarding does not simply lead to women to want any product, but it is instead specific to products used to publicly visible conspicuous consumption. The fourth study looked at the following hypothesis. A maid guarding motive should lead women to seek conspicuous luxury products when the products can be seen by other women who pose a threat to the relationship. This study consisted of 75 female undergraduate students. They were randomly assigned to one of the three conditions. The first condition was the maid guarding female audience condition, the second condition was the maid guarding male audience condition, and the third condition was the control condition. Similar to study 3, participants in a maid guarding condition were given a series of prompts to write about their feelings. The difference between this study and study 3 is that in the female audience condition, the other woman who had been flirting with the date began walking towards the participants, and the two women found themselves alone together. The main dependent measure in the study involved how much participants paid to win a gift card for a luxury shopping spree. Participants were told that to thank them for participating they were being given $5, which was provided to them in $1 bills. With this money they could buy raffle tickets, whereby the more raffle tickets a person purchased, the higher the chance of winning a $200 spending spree. The results of this study showed that the hypothesis was confirmed. Activating a maid guarding motive led women to seek luxury products. When women felt that their romantic relationship was threatened, they desired to spend more on designer handbags and shoes. The fifth study consisted of three different hypotheses. The first hypothesis, hypothesis 5, stated that a woman with luxurious possessions should be perceived by other women as having a more devoted partner, unless those other women are explicitly informed that the male partner has not contributed any resources to her luxury possessions. The next hypothesis, hypothesis 6a, stated that women following a short-term mating strategy should be less willing to pursue a taken man if his partner has luxurious products. And the last hypothesis of this study, hypothesis 6b, stated that women's decreased willingness to poach a taken man when his partner has luxurious products should be mediated by their perceptions of the man as more devoted to his relationship partner. Study 5 consisted of 177 female participants. They were recruited for a 2 times 2 between subjects design. The first two conditions regarded women's products whereby they looked at luxury versus non-luxury products. The second two conditions regarded the person paying for the products whereby they looked at men versus women. The dependent measures consisted of men's devotion to his partner, willingness to pursue a taken man, and women's mating strategy. To look at men's devotion to the partner, the participants were given a description of a woman and the luxurious of her products and who paid for them. Questions were asked such as, how much do you think the man loves this woman? Questions to test the willingness to pursue a taken man included, how likely would you be to go after him? The socio-sexual orientation inventory was used to know a women's mating strategy and it included statements like I believe in taking sexual opportunities when I find them. The results of the first hypothesis, hypothesis 5, showed that this hypothesis was confirmed. 
When the woman was wearing luxury products, other women perceived her partner to be more devoted when the products were purchased by him rather than her. You can see these results in the graph when you look at the grey bars. As you can see in the graph, women who might have an affair, so women with a short term mating strategy, were less likely to pursue the man of a woman wearing luxury products when the man had paid for these products. Following from this result, hypothesis 6a is confirmed. Hypothesis 6b that stated that women's decreased willingness to poach a taken man when his partner has luxurious products should be mediated by their perceptions of the man as more devoted to his relationship partner was also confirmed. So what exactly did we learn from this article? We've learned that women's luxury products function as signals directed specifically to other women and these signals communicate important information about a woman's relationship. The five studies provided strong evidence for this idea. First, they showed that more than half of women reported having a lay belief that their own luxury products can signal to other women how much their partner is devoted to them. They also showed a woman sporting luxurious possessions was perceived by other women as having a more devoted partner. Third, when women's romantic relationships were threatened, women sought more expensive designer handbags, designer cars, designer mobile phones and designer shoes. Fourth, a maid guarding motive also led women to emblazon their products with larger and more prominent luxury brand logos. And lastly, women's luxury products can effectively dissuade other women from poaching her romantic partner. Because other women perceive a man as more devoted to his partner when she is sporting pricey products and other women are less willing to pursue him if his partner has a designer handbag and expensive jewelry. There are also some important implications, limitations and directions for future research resulting from this article. Maid guarding is not the only function of women's conspicuous consumptions. Future research is needed to examine why other people infer heightened devotion by a man whose partner has luxurious products. Furthermore, another limitation of this study is that they did not examine how women behave when their actual relationship is threatened. A last limitation of the current study is that they relied on women from one culture only, the United States of America. We hope you enjoyed this video and most of all we hope you really learned something from it. We want to thank you all for watching.